Okay, so this is going to be lecture number four in our series, A General Introduction to the Bible. And I really want to offer a prayer now uh, for the class, for ourselves, and for the people who are listening and watching. Okay, so let's go to the Father for this. Uh, Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, thank you. You're kind to us and you're forgiving. And uh, you show us such grace and mercy. And uh, Lord God, I pray for the class. We all do. We pray, Lord, that you help us today. Help us in this fourth lecture to retain the things that we learn. Help us, God, to rejoice in the promises you've made in your word, the Bible. Help us to better understand your word and better apply it to our lives. Lord, we want to pray a special prayer for those of us in the class here who are contending with difficult things, who are contending maybe with health or with uh, uncertainty or confusion in the world, we pray for a touch from your spirit uh, to give them peace. And Lord, we extend this prayer out to include all those who may be listening to this MP3 or maybe watching this video. Please touch them, Lord, minister to them by the power of your spirit. Uh, call them into your kingdom, call them into your family. And uh, may we all have fellowship one with another and uh, honoring you as we do it. So commit this time to your, to your care, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, friends, let's, uh, let's pick it up right where we left off now. Remember, we're, we're thinking about um, the Bible's uh, his, history, Bible history. We are thinking about what the Bible tells us about God's action in the world and uh, God's special people group, the nation of Israel. And remember, there were nine historical eras that make up the history of the world and the history, particularly the history of Israel. And we looked at those in lecture three. In lecture four, we want to at least introduce New Testament history. Again, just like with Old Testament history, the New Testament uh, can also be broken down into historical eras. Each era has a central figure and we have a central location. And so this visual comes again right out of Max Anders' book, 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. And the first era in the New Testament is what the, the era we'll call the Gospels era. And the central figure is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels are four accounts of his life. And they are, for your information, they are stellar examples of ancient biography. For many, many years, people wondered what genre the, the Gospels were. What are they supposed to be? Are they biography? Are they just anecdotal rabbinical writing? What are they? Are they parables? Are they fables? And a, an outstanding scholar by the name of Richard Burridge wrote a PhD dissertation on this topic. And he, in his dissertation, he examined uh, a good number of ancient biographies from before the time of Jesus, through the time of Jesus, and just after the time of Jesus. And he, and he spelled out for us in very clear fashion uh, 12 or more diagnostic features of ancient biography. And lo and behold, the Gospels display those features. So the Gospels very clearly are uh, examples of biography. They're telling us about a real person named Jesus. And uh, that's also the name of the first era of New Testament history, the Gospels. Uh, Jesus, of course, the central figure. Now, Max Anders says it's Palestine. Uh, he's got Palestine noted as the central location of the Gospels era. Uh, I think I'm going to quibble about that. I know it's on the visual, but that is the land of Israel. Uh, Matthew's Gospel says they, Jesus' parents journeyed from Egypt back into the land of Israel, the land of Israel, not the land of Palestine. That, that name comes later, after 135 AD. But conventionally, we still refer to it, many Bible uh, books on the Bible, books written to help us understand the Bible, uh, they, they use the name Palestine. You'll see maybe in your Bibles a map of Palestine in the time of Christ. It's really anachronistic. There was no Palestine in the, in the time of Christ. So we probably should call that Israel. Okay. Now the next era, or I guess we could give the storyline summary while we're here. Jesus comes in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies 
of a savior and offer salvation and the true kingdom of God. While some accepted him, most reject him, and he is crucified, buried, and resurrected. And we all know here why Jesus died, right? He died on the cross to pay your sin debt and mine. When he died on the cross, that horrible death he endured, it was the punishment for the sins that we committed. So you have a sinless Jesus, Son of God, who dies to pay for the sins of the whole world. That's what he did there. And of course, he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the grave, uh, showing his, uh, su the sufficiency of his sacrifice and his ultimate power. Okay? The Gospels era is followed by the church era. Now, after Jesus ascended into heaven, where he sits now, uh, the church that he founded, uh, we could say it was about Father's business. It was doing things in those early years after Jesus went into heaven. And the book of Acts picks up right there and tells us about the early church. The central figure, Max Anders has Peter there as the central figure. The central location, Jerusalem. Peter, and this is our synopsis, our storyline summary. Peter, shortly after the ascension of Jesus, is used by God to establish the church, God's next major plan for man. Okay, and we don't want to go too far into detail on this, but remember, in Old Testament times, it was national ethnic Israel, which was God's exclusive channel of blessing for the world. Israel was given prophets, and, and the prophets heard from God, special revelation. The Bible comes from Israel. But Israel rejected her Messiah, Jesus, and Jesus, you know, in his, in his infinite plan, infinitely wise, he had decided he was going to establish a different entity called the church. And so in these days, since, since the cross, basically, Israel has been set aside, and it's the church now. It's God's channel of blessing for the world in terms of special revelation, uh, in terms of who has now been entrusted to preach the gospel to people. It's the church. And, but that doesn't go on forever. We know that one day God will reactivate Israel. There will be national repentance. And Israel will accept her Messiah. And she'll be restored. And she'll be the light that God had called her to be. One, one day. One day. He's not finished with Israel. That's for sure. All right, so after the church uh, era in the New Testament comes the missions era. Now, we're still in the book of Acts, uh, but there's a transition. The book of Acts uh, stops looking at Peter as the central figure, and the book of Acts looks at Paul. Paul becomes our central figure there. The location is not Jerusalem anymore, but the Roman Empire, the whole Roman Empire. And so our synopsis or our storyline summary Paul expands the church into the Roman Empire during the next two decades. So if we were to look at New Testament geography, uh, we would see that in the Gospels era, all the action takes place in this thin tract of land right here. You've got Bethlehem where Jesus was born, Nazareth where Jesus was brought up. You've got Jerusalem where he was crucified. And all this area in between is where he's going to minister for three and a half years. You know, he starts his ministry. He's baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, he preaches and teaches in Galilee and, and travels through Decapolis. And, and he visits Jerusalem, you know, as any faithful Jew would. He would go there for the feasts and so on. But it's a pretty thin tract of land there in the Gospels, okay? By the time you get... Uh, in the book of Acts, particularly the book of Acts, after chapter 13, it's the whole Roman Empire. And again, there's that thin tract of land there that the gospel centers on, but the Apostle Paul, he launches out from Antioch, and every missionary journey takes him further and further west until finally he does find his way to Rome. He ends up in Rome in chains, mind you. And it does seem to be the case that he did, he did get out. For, you know, he was free. The charges against him didn't stick. And he continued his missionary journeys. And probably we, we think uh, he made it all the way to Spain. He says he finished his course. Uh, and uh, the, the church fathers said that he had made it to the extreme border of the West. So, so that's basically the, the Roman Empire, you know, in the book of Acts. So as we go back now and we review 
the arc of Bible history, and, and again, we're going to start with the Old Testament, each of these eras, creation, patriarch, exodus, all those eras, each of those eras can be subdivided into four major points. And this is about as, uh, as, about as detailed as we're going to get in this course. Now, of course, you could subdivide and resubdivide, couldn't you? And you could take any one of those eras and you could teach a college course on it, right? At Miller College, you, you could do that. You could teach, uh, you could take a course on Torah. I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole college course right there. Or, the, or Kings, you know? In this short introduction to the Bible, we're going to subdivide each era into four major sections, and we won't get any more detailed than that, okay? And, and we won't finish in this lecture, but where we finish, we finish, and we'll pick it up next week, okay? So let's begin with the creation era. Remember our synopsis, the creation era. Adam is created by God. Adam is the central figure. Adam is created by God but he sins and destroys God's original plan for man. That's our synopsis of that era. But that era can be subdivided into four points chronologically, and um, we want to look at them in, just in brief summary fashion, okay? The first point that we want to talk about in the creation era is the creation itself. That time block we call the creation era begins with God creating the universe. And he created the universe in how many days? Six. Six days. You got it. And um, when God created the world, guess what he said when he was done? He said, very good. It was beautiful. Beautiful, harmonious, love relationship. No animals killing each other. No people killing each other. No death, no suffering, no mutations. No sickness, natural disaster, crying or pain. It was beautiful. God called that world very good. But remember, God told Adam that he could freely eat of all the trees in the garden in which Adam was placed, but one tree he was forbidden to eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and his wife, Eve, were forbidden from eating of that tree. Now, you know what happened in Genesis 3, don't you? They ate from that tree. They rebelled against God. They listened to Satan, who, you know, sort of convinced the woman to eat first, and then she convinced the husband, and the whole created order fell. And that's the next point there, the fall. The creation was very good, but the second point is the fall. When man rebelled against God and he ate from the tree he was told not to eat from, Adam just didn't fall. Eve didn't just fall. The whole created order was thrown into death and decay. Because man was made king of the earth. You remember this Psalms 8. Man was given dominion, he and, he and his wife, the help meet for him. They were king and queen of the, of the earth. And when they rebelled, the whole thing fell. Through one man sin into the world, Paul tells us in Romans 5.12. And so uh, death well, through one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, that's what he says, and so death has passed upon all men, for that all have, have sinned. And in Romans, the 8th chapter, Paul tells us very clearly that the whole created order groans and travails together in pain until now, because of this thing called the fall, because sin entered the world. The world is not what it's supposed to be because of the fall. And in fact, now the Bible says that after Adam and Eve sinned, and, and brought a fall of humanity, the sin problem on planet Earth got so bad, so terrible, things were so awful, that God had to destroy the world. And he destroyed it with something called the flood, the Genesis flood. And that's the third point there, the third subdivision in the creation era. The Bible says in Genesis 6 to 9 that God flooded the world in a 371-day-long deluge and the highest mountains were covered. And the only people to survive were Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. The, only eight people survived. And two of every air-breathing animal, and seven of some kinds of land-dwelling air-breathing animals. 
uh, aboard Noah's Ark. Now, this is pretty much review for everybody, right? But that's what the Bible teaches. So you have creation itself, very good. Then the fall happened. Then the flood. After the flood, several generations later, humanity was back at it. The Bible says that human, all of humankind gathered themselves in the place called Mesopotamia or um, more specifically the place we today call Iraq, Babylon. And they rebelled against God again. God said, you are to spread out, uh, fill the world. And the people said, we will not spread out and fill the world. We're going to stay right here. As a matter of fact, we're going to build a, a city and we're going to build a tower. See, a city means we're going to have ourselves a one-world political system. And the tower, the temple tower, means we're going to have a one-world religious system. And, and it's in defiance of you, God, is basically what they did. And we call that the Tower of Babel, Babel you bet. And God, in response to this blasphemous building project, God supernaturally changed the languages of the people, and they were dispersed all over the world. And... Um, they found themselves separated by oceans and mountains. And that is basically where the nations were born. God changed the languages. The people spread out. They clustered in little groups that spoke the same language. And in a few generations, the nations began to arise. Right? That's how that happened. Okay? So creation, fall, flood, and tower, those, those are our four basic subdivisions in the creation era. Okay? Make sense to everybody? So after the Tower of Babel, you've got, in a few generations, you've got nations beginning to arise pretty quickly, too, because people were, were never stupid. They weren't subhuman ape people. <laughs> They're brilliant. They were in the middle of building this fantastic project here called the Tower of Babel, this temple tower. Well, into one of these nations, a man named Abram lived, and God called that man Abram. And this is the beginning of the patriarch era. Abraham is chosen by God to father a people to represent God to the world. And again, the patriarch era can be broken down once again into four basic subdivisions, and we don't go any more detail than that. But let's take a look at these subdivisions, okay? The patriarch era begins with the call of Abraham. Now, his name originally is Abram. And God changes his name to Abraham. But for our purposes, we'll just keep calling him Abraham, right? God called that man out of Mesopotamia, said, go to the land that, that I'll show you. And that land's for you and your descendants, Abram, Abraham. And God made a covenant with that man, a special agreement, an unconditional covenant. God said, this is your land. It's for you and your descendants after you. And... Um, and we're told that Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. You know, that is a very, very important point. Uh, if you're a note taker, that's a point you might want to jot down. Abraham believed God. And that was accounted to him for righteousness. That is a precious New Testament reality as well. If you'll trust in Jesus by faith alone, that he paid your sin debt on the cross and you ask him to forgive you your sins and to wash you clean, he'll do it. He'll wash away all your sins, he'll make you something new, and you'll have a home in heaven, you know, reserved for you. It, and it's through faith alone. Abraham is called the father of faith, you know. Really important. Well, Abraham, this goes now into our second subdivision in the patriarch era. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Now, Isaac is called the son of promise, you see, because God promised Abraham many, many descendants. But Abraham, he grew very old, long past the age when you could have children, his wife too. And God did a miracle, and Abraham's wife Sarah had a son, and his name was Isaac, a miracle son. In their old age, they had him. Isaac, the son of promise. Well, Isaac, when he was a boy, at, at, God's at God's command, mind you, Isaac was taken up to the top of Mount Moriah by his father Abraham. 
And you see, God had told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. I want you to offer Isaac as a burnt offering to me. And Isaac went along with his father up the hill. And just before Abraham could slay his son Isaac, God stopped him. He said, don't do it, Abraham. And basically what God was doing there was showing Abraham and showing us and all who would hear that story what real faith looks like. The pagan religious systems at that time were sacrificing their sons and daughters to false gods. Abraham was showing that he had as, at least as much faith in the true God. He would have offered his son, but God stopped him and Isaac was spared. And to this very day, the Jewish people, they remember that it was God's grace there. God stepped in and, and preserved the life of Isaac, their forefather. They know that because God stepped in, they're here today. See? But the Bible tells us that Abraham, before he brought his son to the top of that mountain to, to, to slay him, Abraham really thought about it. And this is very important for us. It, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Abraham understood that promises were made to Isaac. So even if he took the life of Isaac, it must be the case that God would raise him from the dead. You see? And the writer says, in a sense, Isaac was raised from the dead, kind of figuratively speaking. Isaac lived under the sentence of death for three days as he walked with his father Abraham and then finally ascended Mount Moriah. You know who else lived under the sentence of death for three days? The Lord Jesus. On the third day, he rose to life after his crucifixion. See? Wonderful Bible truths, themes that wind their way through the whole of Scripture. Beautiful. And it, it's just a lifelong joyous thing to study the Bible and unearth these wonderful truths, you know. Well, Isaac, we read later on, has a son. And that is the third division in our patriarch era. Isaac has a son named Jacob. And I won't get into great detail on Jacob, except to say that Jacob begins life as a real scoundrel. <laughs> you know, He's a deceiver. He's not the nicest of people. He's a bit of a sneak. He's a supplanter. And yet, uh, God gets a hold of that man. And, and real faith comes to him. He really does become faithful. And he, and he offers sacrifice. And he makes vows to God. And he really does come to believe in the true and living God. That's Jacob. Uh, and, you know, you read, you read about a guy like Jacob and you know right there there's hope for you too. <laughs> right? Uh, I don't think many of us were as much, as much a scoundrel as that guy. But, you know, God can save anybody, right? But Jacob, now this is very important, Jacob has his name changed. Jacob becomes Israel. And Jacob has 12 sons. And his sons become the heads of the, the 12 tribes of Israel. See, Israel, the nation, was split into 12 tribes. And each tribe gets its name from one of the sons of Jacob. That's, you ever wonder? There's the tribe of Reuben and Issachar and Dan and Judah and Simeon. And there's 12 of them. Well, those are the names of the 12 sons of Jacob, okay? And again, those 12 sons become the heads of the 12 tribes named after them. Well, um, Jacob, you see, Jacob has a son named Joseph. And Joseph, well, he, there's a big long story with Joseph, but Joseph is not well liked by his brothers. And his brothers, we read, uh, they assaulted him and they threw him into a pit. And they were going to kill him and they decided against it. Instead, they sold him into slavery and, and Joseph wound up in Egypt. And uh, some terrible things happened to Joseph, but through God's providence, mind you, Joseph rose to a high-ranking position within Egypt's government. And in a severe time of famine, it's Joseph's God-given wisdom and shrewdness that preserves the nation alive. And guess who comes to Egypt for food? The nations, including a little band of people called Joseph's brothers. <laughs> and he reveals to them who he really is. 
It's, it's quite touching, actually. And Joseph doesn't hate them, and he forgives them. And in fact, he sees God's hands in the, in the whole thing. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant this for good. It's a wonderful little lesson there in the book of Genesis on God's providence, you know. And so it happens uh, with Joseph, all his family come and they migrate into Egypt under his governorship. He is second only to the Pharaoh in Egypt. So 70 people, Joseph's family, migrate into Egypt and they're treated well by the Egyptians. They're treated well by the Egyptian government. And it's, a, it's kind of a nice story, you know, what happened there. Now, of course, uh, if we were writing the Bible, we would just kind of want to leave it there. They lived happily ever, ever after in, the, in Egypt, but that's not what happened. This leads us now directly into the next era. And this is the Exodus era. And here's our synopsis, our summary. Through uh, Moses, God delivers the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt and then gives them the law. So the, the Exodus era, just like the creation era and the patriarch era, can be broken down into four subdivisions. And again, we don't get into any more detail than these four subdivisions. But they're really important, so let's talk about them. Remember, Joseph went to Egypt... Under God's providential care, he rose to a position of high honors in the Egyptian government, and his whole family migrated there, and they were treated well by the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, and all was well. But in a couple generations, a new pharaoh took the throne. He did not know Joseph. He did not know what God had done through Joseph, and he grew very suspicious of the Hebrew people in Egypt, and so he decided, lest the Hebrew people join with Egypt's enemies and begin some kind of an overthrow attempt, the Pharaoh decided to enslave the Hebrew people. And in fact, he ordered the Hebrew midwives to destroy all the male babies that were born to Hebrew ladies, didn't he? And of course, the midwives disobeyed the Pharaoh. They kept the babies alive. But... Um, the people cried out to God. 400 years of bondage. And the people cried out to God. And God sent a deliverer named Moses. And you know that story, I think, don't you? Moses, he is, he is one of the Hebrews. And uh, he was miraculously spared. He was taken into Pharaoh's court as just a little child. He grew up in Pharaoh's court. And one day he went out and he was very upset to see his fellow Hebrew brethren being so mistreated he decided he would launch his own exodus program. And he, he killed an Egyptian. And when it, was, when it was discovered what he did, he had to flee for his life. The Pharaoh would have killed him. So he traveled eastward to the land of Midian. And he stayed there for 40 years. You know, he was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. He stayed in, in Midian 40 years. He's 80 years old when God called him miraculously and said, you're the man, Moses. I want you to go back to Egypt and get my people out. And this is what he did. And that's our first subdivision, deliverance. God used Moses and many mighty supernatural sign miracles and plagues to get the people out of bondage in Egypt. He led them out. Wonderful account. Spectacular. You know, sometime read Exodus again. Absolutely breathtaking what God did there. Wonderful record. Well, God led them out... And this leads us to our second subdivision. It's called the law, the giving of the law. God led uh, Moses and all the Israelites, maybe two million people, out to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the law, the Mosaic law. He established a covenant with them. He gave them 613 commandments that are distilled down into 10 commandments, written on the tables of stone. And... Uh, the people said, well, we'll obey that law. We'll, we'll obey every letter of it. And of course, we, it's so tragic. Before Moses is even done delivering the law, they've already broken it in horrible fashion. They were already worshiping idols, you remember? Uh, just a very, very stubborn, stiff-necked, and fickle people. Well, uh, they got through that little rebellion there, and God 
led the children of Israel to the border of Canaan, the promised land, the land that he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to a place called Kadesh Barnea. At Kadesh Barnea, God told the people, go in and take the land. And of course, Israel was unbelieving and they were faithless. They sent spies into the land to look at what was there and they discovered fortified cities and people of enormous stature and the whole awesome spectacle seemed too overwhelming for them. And they didn't believe God that he could bring them in safely. And they rebelled, they didn't go in. That's Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea. And this leads us to the fourth subdivision in the Exodus era, and that's called wandering. God said to Israel, then don't go in. But now you turn and you take your journey into the wilderness. Because you're going to walk out there wandering around for 40 years. Everybody over the age of 20 is going to die out there. And the generation that's coming up, that group of people 20 years old and under, they're going to be the ones to go in and take the land. This older, faithless generation, you're going to die in the wilderness. You didn't want to go in? Go die out there. And in fact, that's what the people asked for. They moaned and complained and they bickered that God wasn't providing for them, that God hated them, and they said, oh, that we would just die in the wilderness. And God said, okay, I grant your wish. Go die in the wilderness. And that's a very sad ending to the, to the Exodus era, isn't it? And uh, it's kind of a lesson for us. I mean, it's kind of a somber note to end our lecture, but uh, the uh, book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 10, uh, it goes into some detail on this. And the Apostle Paul there, he says, in effect, Christian, read that. Read Exodus. Read Numbers. Read those books. And don't make the same bad mistakes those people made. Don't lust after things that they lusted after. Don't be stiff-necked and hard-hearted and faithless like they were. Look at what they suffered in, in consequence of their bad attitude, of their faith, faithlessness, you know. And so all these things now are written for our learning. So we don't, don't behave like those people behaved. When God makes promises to you and me, you can believe those promises. If God says you can go in and you can take those cities, even though there's giants there with swords and spears and shields, uh, you set aside disbelief and you trust them. Okay? And, and I mean that with respect to any promise God makes. Some people think that they are so horrible, that their sin debt is so great, that the things they've done is, are so awful that not even Jesus can, can cleanse them. And we all need to be reminded that Jesus is very great. And if he says, come to him and he will cleanse you, then you need to trust him. He can do it. Just like he said to Israel, you, you can take that land. I'll see that you get it. Just like that. Have some faith. Jesus can take care of you too. He can cleanse you, wash you, regenerate you, make you something brand new on the inside. And he can equip you to do great and awesome things for his glory and for the good of your fellow human being too. Okay? Well, uh, that's the end of uh, lecture number four. And I think that's a pretty good place to, to end this lecture too. Uh, do we have any questions or, or comments before we close out the lecture here? Anything you want to ask or anything you want to offer, friends? Anything? We're good? These people would be lost people. Once Say that again? They would be lost people. Those who reject Christ's offer to save them. Yeah, so the question there is the people who refuse to enter the promised land, those that rebelled at Kadesh Barnea, are they in hell? Is that, that's kind of the question, right? I'm not sure, May, to tell you the truth, that they're all lost in that way. Uh, sometimes people sin against God, and there's consequences for sinning. Tragic consequences on the earth. They may repent later, and God may forgive them, and even save them, and take them into his heaven, but the earthly consequences of their actions must occur. They still must happen, you know. I think about people who are promiscuous. 
uh, people who say, I'm going to sleep with whoever I want. I don't care what you say, God. And then they contract some horrible disease. And they wither away. Sometime in that process, they may come to Christ for salvation. And he'll save them. He'll wash them clean of their sin. And he'll have a home in heaven for them. But their body may still wither away. And they'll still go to the grave, you know. So I like to think that some of those people in the wilderness found salvation in that way, even though their bodies died out there. I know that our God is so great and he's so kind and loving, he's not looking for reasons to keep us out of heaven. He is not willing that any perish in that way, but that all would come to repentance. So it's hard to pronounce eternal damnation on all those people, see? And so those are just some thoughts I'd like to offer on that one there. Okay. Make sense? Hey, Kev. Um, do you know, is there any archaeological that we found um, with reference to uh, the Torah? Do we have any? I know that there is some tantalizing evidence for Babel, but off the top of my head, I, I can't give you anything that I can document right now. And so I'm just going to be reserved on that. If you're interested, there is a friend of mine, his name is Vance Nelson. And Vance has done quite a bit of study on that. So I guess if you Google Vance Nelson, Tower of Babel, you, I bet you you'll find loads of information on that. Uh, about the Tower of Babel? And are there any historical or archaeological evidences for the Tower of Babel? I did hear Vance Nelson um, lecture on this one time, and he offered quite a bit on that. And I took some notes, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> so I, I can't document anything solid right now for you. But th there's a name to start. That that'll get you going there for sure. All right. Okay, well, why don't we close out this lecture with a word of prayer, and then we'll be done for this evening, okay? Our loving God and Father, we thank you uh, once again, dear Lord, for this special time that we can come together, uh, that we can think about uh, your holy book, the Bible, and the history that's there for us, God, that which documents your special action in the world. We ask for your help, God, in Jesus' name, to know the Bible better, to better apply it to our lives, to take you seriously, Lord, when we read what you have to tell us. Uh, help us, dear God, to exemplify real Christian love and compassion and real Christian wisdom as we go about our lives, as we navigate through this life, and as we minister to our fellow human beings. And uh, with that, Lord, we close out this lecture. We pray that everything we say, do, and think would be to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you all. Thanks for coming out.